Iowa Educational Broadcasting Network presents Nicholas Johnson at Grinnell. FCC Commissioner Nicholas Johnson's April 1st speech at Roberts Auditorium, Grinnell College. Well, thank you. You're all very kind. I, uh, I'm not sure this is going to really fit into a uh, series on, on practical politics or whatever it is this is supposed to be about. It's, uh, it certainly hasn't proven to be very practical, and uh, it's proven to be even less uh, politic. I'm pleased here that this is a program of long standing. I must say my experience so far in television has not been very good. I uh, uh, responded when Tommy Smothers came to Washington because he was concerned about what CBS was doing to him, and they explained that uh, the reason why they had to censor 75% of all the programs he put together was that uh, there was FCC regulations that required it, you see. So he came back to Washington to find out if that was really true and uh, talked to Ken Cox and I, and we assured him that that was not true. And he discovered as soon as he landed at the airport in Los Angeles on his way back that his show had been canceled. And, uh, <laughs> and then I went on the, uh, the Dick Cabot program, and he was uh, knocked off the air shortly thereafter and uh, <laughs> recently got back and uh, went on Face the Nation. And CBS was confronted with the first uh, Fairness Doctrine complaint ever filed by a station against a network uh, asking for, uh, for equal time. So. Uh, None of this really bodes very well for your program of, uh, of long standing. <laughs> this may be the last, and we might as well make the most of it. <laughs> uh, you notice there are some uh, television cameras here. Oh, I think the lights just went out. But uh, <laughs> we should note they're not commercial broadcasters. You know, everything today is brought to you by somebody. Have you noticed that? I mean, they've even. Uh, They've even taken over history now, the walk on the moon, brought to you by the Gulf Oil Company. And, uh, you know, the consequence of that was that they did a poll after Nixon had talked to the astronauts on the moon. And 20% uh, and of the people who watched it said uh, they were positive it wasn't true, that it never happened. Because after all, if it was on commercial television, it, you know, it must be hooked up some way. And that's, uh, that's kind of what I'd like to... Uh, talk to you a bit about uh, this evening, uh, what, the, uh, what the corporations are, are doing, uh, to, to our heads, really, you know, rather than to the environment. I mean, it's not that I don't think that's important. It, it is. Somebody thought the tactics for the survival and the corporate statement, you know, ecology and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm really, uh, this evening at least, more interested in the, uh, in the garbage inside our heads than the garbage they're throwing in the air. Uh, the same guys are doing both, you know. I mean, uh, um, and kind of what, you know, what can we do about it? There's a, there's a subtitle on the, on the uh, topic, actually. It's uh, uh, Tactics for Survival in the Corporate State or uh, a Life and Love and Other Stuff. And uh, uh, between the two topics, it covers just about whatever I want to say. Reminds me of a judge in Texas who just had one, one lecture topic he ever used. It was called Law is Universal. And he used it for years. <laughs> now, before I talk about life and love and other stuff, I should e explain, I suppose, in proper judicial fa fashion, why it is that I have jurisdiction over that area, you see, and how I got interested in that. Um, and it came about because it seems to me that an FCC commissioner who is... Uh, uh, according to his commission of office, supposed to be regulating broadcasting in the public interest, but really has to concern himself with things other than just uh, whether or not people are operating on frequency and whether they've painted their antenna towers. We had a great interest in antenna tower painting, actually. We, uh, it was one of the matters of greatest concern to the commission at one time. We had a number of private pilots. Uh, on the commission, and they felt very strongly about antenna tower painting. I don't, I don't mean to put it down. I mean, it is important, but, uh, <laughs> but it always seemed to me that programming also was uh, a subject that should be given some attention by the commission. This has been a uh, sort of a lonely quest on my part. I couldn't find any other commissioner, really, who felt that way, you see, but I proceeded with it nonetheless. Um, you know, television, this is kind of fundamental, but it's worth reflecting about. I guess it was uh, Don Hayakawa, the semanticist, who once said that uh, 
uh, man is no more conscious of the, uh, of the words, of the language in which he lives than a fish would be conscious of the waters of the sea. And I think that's very largely true of our, of our attitudes about television as well. We kind of accept it. It's, it's, there, uh, it's there in the air and it just uh, comes on that little glass screen. And we don't think there's much we can do about it, and we don't think much about its impact upon us. But uh, obviously it's had, uh, like the automobile, like telephone, it's had tremendous impact on our society, and really even much more than, than those two uh, innovations. The average school child, by the time he enters kindergarten, has received more hours of instruction from television. And I use the word instruction deliberately because it's all educational television, not just uh, this station that's uh, televising this tonight. The only question is, what is it teaching? But it's all teaching something, you see. The average child, by the time he enters kindergarten, has received more hours of instruction from television than the number of hours you spend in a college classroom earning a BA degree. By the time an uh, average child is a teenager, he's been exposed to 350,000 commercials, almost 20,000 hours of programming. Average man of 65 will have spent, measured in 24-hour days and 365-day years, will have spent nine full years of his life watching television. I mean, next to sleeping and working, what Americans do is watch television. That's how we spend our time. Now, some of the commercial broadcasters and advertisers like to argue that uh, they're not really having any effect on anybody. It's just, you know, just good fun and good business. And, uh, and yet it seems to me it's very difficult for them to sustain this argument because uh, some three billion dollars a year is being uh, invested by merchandisers in television who believe that they are getting a return on that $3 billion investment. As uh, Professor Galbraith has said, radio and television are the prime instruments in the manipulation of consumer demand. And the stories are, are legion of the fellow who was making less toil in the back of a garage, 100,000 bottles a year. Somebody told him about television, he borrowed $9 million and invested it in a TV ad campaign, and within three years he was selling, instead of 100,000 bottles a year, 100 million bottles a year. Uh, the Dreyfus Fund went from assets of $92 million to $1.3 billion, and concluded, uh, as a result of an advertising campaign on television, later concluded, TV works for us. <laughs> well, a, a great many uh, merchandisers have concluded that. It's been a great thing for the cosmetics industry. We now have a male cosmetics industry, as you know, all these uh, uh, uptight uh, uh, male chauvinist uh, masculine guys are now buying $1 billion a year worth of male cosmetics. You know that? So, you know, how can you do that except with television? So they like to argue that uh, the advertising has this great effect, but the uh, uh, but the programs don't. Well, by now we've seen task force report after task force report that reaches contrary conclusions. The uh, uh, Kerner Commission took a look at race relations in the United States. Ended up discovering that it had to devote an entire chapter to the role of television in the worsening state of, uh, of blacks in America the worsening state of relations between whites and blacks in the United States. As they put it, the communications media ironically have failed to communicate. And they probed in some detail the impact on whites and blacks alike of an industry that was at that time, in the mid-1960s, virtually excluding uh, black faces from the television screen. Then we had the uh, assassinations and the establishment of the Eisenhower Commission on Violence. It has now published two volumes on the impact of violence in television, on violence in our society. The cigarette smoking uh, 
controversy. Many agencies of government trying to help people cut back on their cigarette smoking. Federal Trade Commission, Surgeon General, United States Congress. The only thing that really turned that around and began a decline in the number of cigarettes uh, smoked for the first time in history virtually were those anti-cigarette smoking spots that went on television. And there's quite a story behind that too. Um, because that was kind of the first time, you see, that uh, the people had ever been exposed to truth on television. <laughs> and it was a very unsettling experience for the, for the fellows that run uh, commercial television. And, uh, I mean, folks would be sitting there, hey, Ma, come look at this. This fellow, you know, he's not trying to sell us something, you know. He cares for us. And, of course, they were afraid that once this thing caught on, people would start demanding truth in other areas of, uh, <laughs> of commerce. And, uh, I mean, you know, if you think we've got a recession now, you can imagine what it would be like if we start telling truth about all these products. So there was a great demand to cut back on that. And ultimately, the cigarette companies made the ultimate sacrifice and agreed that they would take off cigarette uh, commercials entirely rather than run the risk of bringing the rest of the commercial house toppling down as well with uh, truth spots on other subjects. So as these task force reports kept coming out, I was reading the literature coming out of the academic community and other commentators, it seemed to me that uh, you know, we've kind of passed the time when we can set up a new task force report, a new task force every time we have another social problem, and have somebody investigate it and find out that, <laughs> lo and behold, television's got something to do with that. You know, it's time we really address the thing frontally. So that got me into the matter of uh, kind of the general indicators that the society has fallen apart. And an attempt to kind of track that back and figure out how that might be related to television in some way. Now, let me make clear at the outset, I am not saying, and I think it would be preposterous to suggest, that television is the sole cause of any problem in our society. I mean, we had all kinds of problems before television, and television has done some good, and we're going to have all kinds of problems after television, and so forth. But I think it's, it's equally short-sighted to argue that television has not been a component and a very significant component of virtually every problem in our society. And that that is, is something we ought to explore more than we have. Now, you look around, you see a lot of, uh, you see a lot of statistics that are pretty troubling. A lot of this has been predicted, incidentally, by uh, old psychiatrists like uh, Rollo May and Eric Fromm uh, 20 years ago, who said that the late 60s were going to contain the, the kind of falling apart of society that we have by now witnessed and recorded in the history books. They saw it coming. And I want to come back to their comments later because they're pretty significant. But in the last 10 years, We've seen a 50% increase in number of patients in mental hospitals and psychiatric outpatient clinics, 50% increase in number of narcotics addicts. Among the age group of 15 to 24, suicide now ranks as the fifth uh, leading cause of death. Uh, crimes against the person have doubled. The problems of alcoholism, I think, have been pointed out not just in this state, but throughout the United States, the leadership of, of Senator Hughes. Uh, we hear a lot about drug problem, but uh, you don't hear uh, people say too much about the problem, or number one hard drug problem, which is alcoholism. There are more alcoholics in San Francisco alone than there are narcotics addicts in the entire United States. But all these things are on the upswing. And even for those of us who don't figure in the statistics, I think we still feel the same pressures that are producing these kinds of statistics. 
And that's the kind of thing that, that Fromm and, and May are talking about. They said in the late 40s, early 1950s, there are pressures, call them vibes if you want to, whatever language is most appealing to you, in our society that affect all of us. In the early stages, the only people with antenna sensitive enough to pick up the fact that something's wrong somewhere are the artists who try to communicate this to the rest of us in some fashion, in sculpture or music or painting or drama. And they succeed more or less depending upon how attuned we are and how effective they are and the psychotics and neurotics who the psychiatrists are working with. And it's only later that the rest of us begin to feel the same kind of pressures, same kind of problems. It may just produce a dull ache that we're totally incapable of being articulate about, or it may throw us into uh, one of these statistical columns. But the pressures are still there. And this is not just the comment of uh, intellectuals and college students and so forth. It shows up even in the country and western music, a song called Where It's At that uh, George Hamilton IV sings. I don't know whether you all listen to country and western or not, but I, I try to listen to that along with rock and the rest of it, because I think you can get a better sense of where the country's going from the music, perhaps, and from anything else. And this is music mostly for uh, uh, working class people, farmers, truck drivers. Lately it seems everything I see tells me life is moving much too fast. And underneath the strain, folks don't act the same. And if that's progress, I'll take the past. Now you don't have to agree with all of what that's saying to recognize that there is an expression from and to uh, people who are not uh, fortunate enough to be students at Grinnell College that are aware of the same kind of pressures that, that you're talking about. Here's the way Eric Fromm put it. A specter is stalking in our midst whom only a few see with clarity. A completely me a mechanized society devoted to maximal material output and consumption. And in this social process, man himself is being transformed into a part of the total machine, well-fed and entertained, yet passive, unalive, and with little feeling. Now, what does television have to do all with all of this? The first thing you have to recognize about television, aside from the statistics I started off with, about the impact upon the lives of all of us just in terms of time, television is our principal source of information, of ideas, of inspiration, of culture, of moral values, sense of political priorities. And yet we have taken television in this country and turned it over almost exclusively to the cause of merchandising and consumption, consumer manipulation. Now, you don't have to be opposed to free private enterprise or private property or American business community to say that maybe this has gone a little bit too far. In other words, there is a role for business in America. And we can get in arguments about whether or not we want American corporations cutting down the redwood trees and pouring oil on the beaches and open strip mining and throwing the garbage in the air and the water. And most of us don't like that. But, you know, that's just our physical environment and, you know, after a while the earth stops turning and it's all over. But, you know, meanwhile, Meanwhile, people still have 
you know, the integrity of their own person. But when you take your head and you let those guys in there and they start messing around with that, then we're in real trouble as a society. As Mason Williams has said, American television does to your mind what American business has done to the land. A lot of people already think like New York City looks. <laughs> now in the first place, television is owned by big business. I mean the transmitters and the studios and the artists and the writers and the book and the contracts and the, all of it. It's owned by big business. These are some of the largest corporations in America. And you check in the largest 50 markets in the United States where 75% of the American people are served by television, virtually all of those network-affiliated VHF television stations are owned by the networks, by chain owners, or by newspapers in those local communities, with almost no exceptions. So it's owned by big business in the first place. But then it is also programmed by big business. And obviously, the same guys who are paying for the commercials are paying for the programs. You don't mistake that for a moment. And the programs have to be consistent with the commercials in ways that we'll see in a moment. But first, This is the Mason Williams all-purpose commercial. You can use this to sell any product. Ready? At last, new from us, this amazing dramatic proof. There, see, you can. It's easy. You mean America's favorite modern families? Yes, because they use that other stuff in tests. But without the special ingredient of a magic formula, now available in two sizes, fresh and moist, and especially made so effectively light and lovely, that the leading new word for all you ladies combined with their report is a timely message of less than a minute and quick to fix from now on. So why not try big, tough, super flakes of special interest for all you guys with twice the power and vitamins necessary for a high rate of saturated duh that is free for an unlimited time only with every, hey! <laughs> now, back to our story. Here's a fella in the advertising business. Here's the way he felt about you when you first turned on that television set. Now, quote, this is advice to other merchandisers and advertisers. It takes time conditioning the reflexes of children, yes. But if you expect to be in business for any length of time, think of what it can mean to your firm in profits if you can condition a million or 10 million children who will grow up into adults, trained to buy your product as soldiers are trained in advance when they hear the trigger words, forward march. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> yeah. Joe Seldon has said, manipulation of children's minds in the fields of religion or politics would touch off a parental storm of protest and a rash of congressional investigations. But in the world of commerce, children are fair game and legitimate prey. As any of you know who've ever accompanied them to a, a supermarket, all of which prompted Robert Choate to observe the nutrition expert testifying on breakfast cereals, almost none of which he found to have any nutritional value <laughs> whatsoever. Not just are the kids, you know, not getting any nutritional value out of the breakfast, it's worse. He says, our children are being programmed to demand sugar and sweetness in every food, are deliberately being sold the sponsors less nutritious products, and are being counter-educated away from nutrition knowledge. See. Now that's what the commercials are doing. Now what does it do to the programs? Some of you may remember I don't know, maybe you don't, but uh, in the early days, you may have read about it, or maybe your grandparents told you about it, in the early days of uh, television, uh, there was some original drama 
on TV from time to time. A uh, very famous film called Marty, written by Patty Chayefsky, was originally prepared for television in the early 1950s. Chayefsky and other great American dramatists were uh, writing a lot of these uh, shows. And then they disappeared. I mean, they were still winning Pulitzer Prizes, but they weren't appearing on television. And so Eric Barnow, who's written the three-volume history of American broadcasting, decided he'd look into that and try to figure out why that ever happened. Why were those taken off? And he dug up the memoranda within the networks and within the advertising agencies. And here's what he concluded. So these plays, akin to genre paintings, held consistently high ratings. But one group hated them, the advertising profession. The reasons are not mysterious. Most advertisers were selling magic. Their commercials posed the same problems that Chayefsky's drama dealt with, people who feared failure in love and business. But in the commercials, in the commercials, there was always a solution as clear-cut as the snap of a finger. The problem could be solved by a new pill, deodorant, Toothpaste, shampoo, shaving lotion, hair tonic, car, girdle, coffee muffin recipe, or floor wax. <laughs> the solution always had finality. Chayefsky and other anthology writers took these same problems, made them complicated. They were forever suggesting that a problem might stem from childhood and be involved with feelings toward a mother or father. All of this was often convincing. And that was the trouble. It made the commercial seem fraudulent, as indeed it was. <laughs> Lest you assume that I'm just editorializing, let me read you from the Procter & Gamble editorial policy. Quote, there will be no material that may give offense, either directly or by inference, to any commercial organization of any sort. How do you like that, folks? And then they say there's not censorship. You know, the uh, uh, Ford Motor Company sponsored a program on television. They took out a scene in New York because it showed the Chrysler building. <laughs> That's back in the good old days. Mason Williams, again, has put it very succinctly. Television is a pimp for big business. He has a way of putting it in a single line. And um, here's a little poem he did after serving as head writer for the Smothers Brothers program and winning an Emmy Award for his efforts. He said getting an Emmy from television is like getting a kiss from somebody with bad breath. <laughs> this is out of the Mason Williams reading matter. It's called The Censor. The Censor sits somewhere between the scenes to be seen and the television sets, with his scissor purpose poised, watching the human stuff that will sizzle through, the magic wires and light up like welding shops, the ho-hum rooms of America. And with a kindergarten arts and crafts concept of moral responsibility, snips out the rough talk, the unpopular opinion, or anything with teeth, and renders a pattern of ideas full of holes, a doily for your mind. <laughs> Hal David and Bert Bachrock for uh, Diane Warwick. 20 houses in a row, 80 people watch a TV show, paper, paper people, cardboard dreams, how unreal the whole thing seems. Can we be living in a world made of paper mache? Patrick Watson, who did a marvelous show up in, in Canada called uh, This Hour Has Seven Days, on which my sister worked for a while. So Katie's here somewhere. Where are you, Katie? She's over there. And uh, he wrote uh, in a book called Conspirators in Silence, the characteristic disease of the mass media is anesthesia, a craving to avoid reality. It is a deep-rooted, cleverly constructed neurosis that leads the patient compulsively and unconsciously whenever he is confronted with a choice 
to opt for repose instead of awareness. Or, as Mason always succinct puts it, whenever TV gets off into life, it gets lost. <laughs> now, what happens to us as a result of the fact that the American mind is being programmed almost exclusively by merchandisers? What is all this television that I claim is educational television. What is all this television doing to us, this commercial television? What's it selling? The one thing it's selling is the concept of conspicuous consumption. You know that, from, I mean, you still read Thorsten Veblen theory of the leisure class in, in school? Well, anyway, that's, you know, that's buying stuff and kind of letting it show. <laughs> That's conspicuous consumption. And deriving some psychic satisfaction from that, which we'll discover is sick. Here's a Buick ad. It goes on with this long dialogue. And then a Mrs. it's a Mr. and Mrs. Davis. And Mrs. Davis says, we're a young family and we're driving a Buick. And people think, well, gee, maybe, maybe you're really coming up in the world. Now, what's that selling, see? That was another problem that the, uh, that the advertising agencies had with uh, Patty Chayefsky, some of these other dramatists. Uh, the advertising agency said this right in their memo. They said, look, we're trying to tell people to move up to Chrysler. And what you're telling them is that people can find fulfillment and satisfaction and love and happiness in lower class settings. That it doesn't have to do with products. And we're trying to sell. See, and your message is inconsistent with what we're trying to do. So that's one thing it teaches us. Conspicuous consumption is the sort of the sole measure of fulfillment and of your search for identity. Your identity is to be found in the cosmetics you apply to your skin, the clothing you drape upon your body, and the automobile and the house that you wear because you wear your automobile in your home in the same way you wear your clothes. And the more you give your attention to the externals, to the layers, the less you give your attention to the inside, and the worse it gets. That's what's prompted Mason in his new book, Flavors, in a section called Autobiography, which is the story of his life in automobiles, to write. We're like a racehorse shot full of speed to make us run harder than is good for us, to win for the owners and lose for ourselves, to win the race for only the price of the chance to run. So you get a shortened work week and you go out in moonlight and get another job so you can get another car, another color, color television set. Second thing television commercials teach us an awful lot of commercials at least, is that drugs are the answer. Senator Moss has, has said that the, the principal drug problem is generated by the television commercials. Spiro Agnew's view is that it all comes from rock music. He and I have disagreed on that subject publicly on occasion. But it's, it's all through the day. Again, it's, see, television is trying to get you to turn off to yourself and turn on to television. Television is trying to keep you stupid so you'll watch it. Television tells you the way to get through the day, I mean as if getting through the day is the way to frame your life in the first place, the way to get through the day is with the caffeine in your coffee, the nicotine in your cigarettes, the alcohol in your three martini lunch, the stomach settler after lunch because you ate too much. They say when you, ate too, when you eat too well, malarkey. You know, let me talk to you about food. You're not eating well, you're killing yourself. But in any event, stomach settler to solve that problem. Um, and then the, the little tranquilizers and the pep-me-ups and the calm-you-downs and the, and the uh, 
the sleeping tablets at night, you know, nitol and that whole thing. Gentle little blue pill compose. Now listen to this. Listen to this. I mean, if you didn't know what this product was, I'll bet all you could guess, and you'd guess wrong, but listen to this ad. Leave your feeling of tension behind and step into a quiet world. You'll feel calmer, more relaxed with quiet world. The new modern calmative. Leave your tension, your feeling of tension behind with quiet world. Wow, see? And then these same cats that write these things get together at their three martini lunch and sit around and try to figure out how they can draft public service announcements that'll convince you that that 16th chemical is gonna bring the downfall of the republic and the ruination of your life, see? I mean, they can run it up Spiro Agnew's flagpole, but nobody's gonna salute it. <laughs> We got a drug problem, all right, but you know, it's being sold to us by the same corporate guys who are making the contributions to the major political parties, both of them. That's not a partisan statement. Why don't they do something about those fellows who Senator Moss thinks are the principal problem? If you're really serious about doing something about drug problem, why not let people find that the answer is not to be found in the drugs? It's to be found someplace else. Then, the third thing's a little complicated. It's what I call a corporate interlock. Now, what this means is that once you get caught in this system, there's very nearly no getting out. I mean, all these pieces work together. You go to work for the corporation, and you live in the suburb, and you get the house, and then you got to commute to work, right? And we don't have mass transit because the, you know, the auto companies and the cement companies and the highway builders and all that have seen to it that we're not going to use any of that gasoline tax money to build transportation systems that really serve the country. So you're not going to have any mass transit. So you've got to get a car, and they won't let you buy an electric car. So you've got to get an internal combustion engine. And you've got to drive that into work and commute, see? And then you've got to dress. I mean, I wore my commissioner uniform for you, especially tonight because I, I didn't bring my bicycle or my guitar, but this is what it looks like, and this is the way you have to look when you go into one of their buildings, see? And once you get dressed up like this and you're driving a car, that means you gotta use the underarm deodorant and the whole bit, see? <laughs> and get air conditioning in the car. As soon as you take the job, you've already made the decision to get the automatic dishwasher detergent. Now let me explain to you how that happens. You see, you get the job, and then you live out in this suburban house. Now, you get out in the area where you got to live, and all the houses are alike, and all the people are alike, and the children are alike, and the dogs are alike, and the cars are alike. <laughs> the houses are all too big. I mean, they really are too big. I mean, you don't need all that space, see. But once you got it, and the floors look so ugly, you know, because they use that cheap wood in them, you feel like you want to cover it with wall-to-wall -wall carpeting because that's what it tells you on television. When, you know, when they're selling you the, that little spray on wax, you know, they're not just selling you the wax. Look in the backdrop. Here are those drapes and that wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and all expensive furniture, see? And they're selling you the whole bed. I mean, that's one thing you've got to understand. A commercial for anything is selling everything else, see? And so then once you get the whole house covered with that cheap carpet, you pretty near got to get a vacuum cleaner to vacuum it with, see? Because you can't sweep it and stuff. All right, now what happens out in the kitchen? You got this big kitchen, you got all these built-in cabinets, right? And you go out there and, and wow, you just, every time you go through them, there's all this empty space in these cabinets. So gradually, you're in a store and you, somebody's got a sale on dishes and you buy them and put up there and some guy comes around and sells you pots and pans and you put them and you gradually fill up your kitchen like all the other folks that live out there where you do. Well, then pretty soon you got your kitchen filled with all this stuff, see? Now, you don't have to cook that way. I mean, you can use a little camp cook set, see, and just have the three pots and stuff. And if you get one dirty, you rinse it out. And it's easy to rinse out because it hadn't baked on, gotten hard on there yet. And you rinse it out and you use it for the next thing, see? You don't have all those dirty dishes to do. But of course, you don't do it that way because you've got this whole pot and pan set. And, you know, as long as it's there, you want to use it. So it gets so complicated 
If you want to make a peanut butter sandwich, you got an afternoon's worth of dishes to clean up, see? <laughs> and once that happens, you suddenly realize you've been using all these dishes and it takes so much time, it really does take a long time to wash the dishes. You've got to get the automatic dishwasher. And once you get the automatic dishwasher, you try any other kind of soap in there and they've got it fixed so it'll suds over and go on the floor. Have you ever done that? <laughs> it's terrible. It's a mess. So that's what I mean. By the time you get the job with a big corporation, you've already made the decision to buy that automatic dishwasher detergent. See? You begin to catch on to that? Mason and I, one night at his house out in L.A., we were sitting around rapping and playing a guitar, and, and we were deciding what we were going to do to eat and, and wondering whether we should go out or not. And Mason and I decided we'd stay there because we didn't want to have to dress up, and that got him to be kind of reflective because he's sort of reflective about everything. And he said, uh, Nick, do you ever stop to wonder why it is you have to dress up when you go out to the restaurant? And I said, no, Mason, never did think about that. Why is that? <laughs> He says, I just figured it out. He said, it's because the same fellas that own the restaurants own the clothing stores. <laughs> now, when you begin to really understand that, you're well on the way. You gotta, you gotta break out of, the, of this lock that they got on you, see? They even sell, they even sell uh, uh, the commercial way of life in the commercials. The headache remedies are especially good. Here's one for Anison. It's woman one and woman two. That's the way they wrote it out. Here you are, dear. Oh, thanks. But I can't look at another dress. All this shopping has given me such a headache. I'm coming back to that in a moment. Remember that line. <laughs> I'll get you something. Wait a minute. It better be something strong. Woman one. I've got what you need, Laura. What's that? Anison. <laughs> okay. Now, let me tell you about headaches. See? Most of the time, when you've got a headache, what it is, is that these muscles back here get all tense. See, and tight. And that makes your headache. Now, if you got a headache, the best thing to do is just lie down and get somebody to massage the back of your neck, which is a pretty nice thing to do anyhow. <laughs> Sometimes I do when I don't even have a headache. <laughs> but you just get somebody to massage back your neck and your headache go away, see? Now, the other thing, so the first thing to wonder is whether you need the aspirin in the first place. The second thing to ask yourself, especially about that commercial, see, it just could be that what's giving you the headaches, <laughs> see, what's giving you the headaches are the bad vibes you get out of the office buildings and the stores that those guys run. And maybe the answer is to stay out of there. <laughs> but they don't want you to believe that, see. They want you to think that that headache just doesn't have anything to do with that commercial life they're selling. It's just one of the mysterious things that just happened when you were in that store. See, that's your body telling you something to get out of there. But they say, no, don't get out. Just take an aspirin and go on buying. <laughs> <laughs> now we come to the matter of, of television's impact upon women and uh, attitudes about sex generally. Here's a president, uh, who is a woman, of a, an advertising agency, Franchelle Cadwell. She says, no force has demeaned women more than advertising. Here's Marion Delgado at a CBS shareholders meeting. You use our bodies to sell products. You blackmail us with the fear of being unloved if we do not buy. Donna Keck in The Art of Maiming Women. Many of us break our backs trying to realize the dream, the synthesis of housewife sex mate. Many of us fall along the way, victims of nervous breakdowns, schizophrenia, and sheer exhaustion. But few realize the oppression of the system, the oppression of the system which propels them unrelentlessly towards rotten goals. See, think about that. Rollo May says that one of the chief things which keeps us from learning to love in our society 
is our marketplace orientation. We use love for buying and selling. Cut to country and western song. Gonna put my love in a one ad. I'm gonna find me someone new. Norman Mark, a Chicago Daily News television critic, a very perceptive, intelligent guy. One can search television for a long time before finding a mature sexual relationship. And to pause. Hello to the good old summertime. Hello to new romance. Hello to wedding bells that chime. I mean, this is really getting dirty. <laughs> They'll go to any length. Hello to flirty glances. You want flirty glances, girls? Goodbye to all those lonely hours I'd spend on Saturday night. They're going to, you know, get rid of your loneliness and get you married. No more ignored. Now I'm adored since I switched to Ultra Bright. That's right. That's right. And while you're at it, it takes the enamel off your teeth. I'll tell you about bicarbonate of soda later. I got a new book of Johnny Hartford's called Word Movies, and he's got a whole poem in here about baking soda. That's great stuff. But meanwhile, I've got a poem of mine. I, I wrote this once I was sitting on an airplane, and I looked at this stewardess, see? And, no, I mean, I really feel sorry for stewardess. I really do. And that's why it's called stewardess. Business does to its women's bodies what it does to its men's minds. It binds them tightly, snuffing out the free, covering with a uniform, painting any parts that stick out with the company colors and a smile, making replaceable people with replaceable parts, wigs and brains, ink. That's stewardess. Now, what do you do about all this? You're caught up in the middle of it. You're not only surrounded by television programs and commercials, but billboards and magazines and, worse yet, people who've been sold this bill of goods and are driving themselves towards uh, uh, unhappy and empty lives and are setting standards seemingly for you that you're expected to follow unless you appear to be deviant of some kind from what your society expects of you. Well, I addressed that question because I felt it was part of my responsibility as a commissioner and because I was interested in it personally anyhow. Because, yeah, you know, I'm a product of the same thing. We all are. And uh, nobody's immune from this who lives in America. And I decided the best place to think about it was uh, somewhere off in the, in the woods where I could get as far away from all that as possible and as far back to where it all began as possible. And so I went off to West Virginia and I sat there and I thought. And what I concluded is nothing really very original. Most of you are into this a lot farther than I am, so I'm not telling you all much new. But for me, it was an interesting experience because I spent most of my life as a, you know, as a lawyer, law professor, public official, worked hard, long hours, wrote my articles and stuff like that, like I was supposed to. And I tried to break down life into what seemed to me to be sort of the basic components of you know, what a whole life might be all about. Because I had become impressed with those uh, philosophers and theologians and psychiatrists and poets over the centuries who've been trying to get through to us about what human life can be for each of us. The general semanticist Alfred Korzybski came up with the concept of unseen to describe the bulk of us. And most of us are not insane, but we're certainly not sane in the sense of fully functioning human beings. I've recently uh, been reading Heinlein's book, Stranger in Strange Land. 
some of you may have read. And he's dealing with the same kind of a subject, I think, in a science fiction format, describing in his own way and with his own story, uh, trying to get us to realize that we could be a great deal more than what we are. In fact, this theme runs through a great deal of literature of, uh, since printing began. <coughs> It seemed to me that the, probably the first most essential thing is, uh, is a relationship of love with somebody else. And having said that, I won't elaborate on it because uh, I think we probably had enough written about that. Uh, then it seems to me that you need to, you need to have some time when you're truly creative. But that's sort of the essence of humanness. You need to have some time, I'm talking about every day, I'm not talking about taking a week off once a year. Time when you're, when you're contemplative, when you're reflective about yourself and your own life. Whatever form or way you may do that. I think you need to have some time every day when you're some way identified with nature, some way reflective about your role on this, on this earth as a, as a bit of life in relation to the rest of it. You can do that in a variety of ways. You, uh, as with all these things, you've got to work it out within your own life. You can't follow somebody else's pattern. I think that it's very helpful to be doing something that society recognizes as a productive activity. Uh, and this is one of the things that uh, uh, I find particularly attractive about uh, some of the women's lib uh, efforts to uh, make it possible for, for women to participate in a more equal and fair way in the, uh, productive work and gain the satisfactions that come from that, which requires obviously some sharing on the part of the man with the responsibilities at home. Um, which comes to the final thing, which is uh, what I call life support activities. The things that go into making your life possible, uh, food, clothing, transportation, shelter, so forth. You know, you don't do all of this. I'm not suggesting you ought to leave and, and uh, go off and live in the woods someplace. I'm just saying that you ought to do some of it. You ought to keep some contact with uh, what it is that makes life possible for you. Now, it's easier for you to do that uh, because it's quite natural for you and, and in fact, essential for, for you. Uh, but after you've been out of here not long, you'll find that it's, it's possible to live and do almost nothing whatsoever to support yourself. I mean, there are transportation systems and Food is prepared and laid on the table, and clothing is in closets, and, and houses are built by other people, and, and uh, uh, you find that you've uh, devoted virtually your whole life to professional activity. Um, now, so the challenge, it seems to me, is how can you bring as many of these qualities as possible into your daily life in a city, life within the corporate state? And there are things you can do. One is to just think in terms of simplicity. What are, what are the complicated things you can cut out of your life? One way of starting this, just go through your, your kitchen cabinet, your, your bathroom cabinet. Look at all those aerosol cans, see? And ask yourself, now, if I were living in the West Virginia woods, five miles up a rocky road from a city of 25 people, would I hike into town to buy me an aerosol can of room freshener? Okay. And then start looking around and seeing what products you can substitute for simple things. And that brings me to Johnny Hartford's little song about baking soda. Hooray for baking soda! This is another commercial. I, and I make no apologies about this. I'll explain this about baking soda in a moment. Hooray for baking soda, ain't it neat? And cheers for National Baking Soda Week. For folks that's young and folks that's old, bicarbonate of soda will cure that cold. It cleans your teeth and prevents the flu, and you can use it in your car battery, too. It puts out fires of fat or grease. Pass the baking soda, please. Now, if your biscuits, cakes, or pies absolutely refuse to rise, get the stuff that's always slick. That baking soda does the trick. And if you're feeling far from placid from an overexcess of stomach acid, just step right up and yell, don't stammer, get a big mess of that arm and hammer. And if you cannot clean your dentures with any other commercial ventures from Portland, Maine to North Dakota, smart folks, Dunkin' Baking Soda. 
but beware your fun, you botch. This ain't the kind you mix with scotch. <laughs> you can take out of your, I mean, for this little box, for 12 cents, see? Little box of banks over 12 cents. It's this simple compound. You can throw away all your toothpaste and tooth powders, your gargles and your mouthwashes, and you can use it for burn ointment too. I'm not sure he mentioned that. And he's right, you can use it to put out fires, you can use it as a room freshener. You can use it to clean up if you've got smelly old bottles and stuff like that. You can put it in there and it'll clean them up just real nice or clean out the icebox or something like that. You can make a clay out of it for kids to play with. You can throw away all those other cans of stuff, see? You don't need one of those aerosol cans of shaving soap either. You know, you can just use a brush and a bar. Start looking around at every little thing around you and ask, you know, can I throw that away and do without it entirely or can I substitute something simple for it? Transportation. In my case, I like to bicycle. That's not practical for everybody. I recognize that. If it's not, all right, then work out something else for yourself. But you know what happens with an automobile? is one day you just wake up and it's like giving up smoking. You just realize you don't want another automobile ride. It's bad for your head. It gives you bad feelings inside a car. It cuts you off from the air and from other people, from life. It gets you honking on the horn and mad at folks. And you realize there just must be more to life than commuting to boring jobs and junky automobiles through polluted air, listening to radio commercials. And there is. So you don't give up automobile driving because you hate General Motors, but you're afraid to bomb one of their auto plants. <laughs> you give it up because you just don't want it anymore. No hard feelings. Don't think twice. It's all right. Just you go on bicycle now on because you feel better. Your blood gets to circulating. Nice little thoughts come into your head. If you're lucky, like I am in Washington, I can go in along the CNO Canal or through the park. I'm surrounded by the trees and the wildlife. It's a beautiful way to begin the morning. That's why you bicycle. It's better for your head. Well, you'll find lots of things like that that you can do, you see. Johnny's also got this. I don't, know if you, I don't know if he's recorded this song yet. The good old-fashioned washing machine. Have you heard that? Because, see, sometimes you can, when you want to have equipment, you might prefer an older one to a newer one. I cry when I see that brand-new automatic washing machine because I'm sentimental for the old machine still yet. Because the old one really looked like a real live washing machine. But the new one just looks more like a television set. <laughs> See, you discover that the less you have, the better you feel. Here's some relevant quotes. Phil Slater says, to accumulate possessions is to deliver pieces of oneself to dead things. Possessions can absorb emotions, but unlike personal relationships, they feed nothing back. See, there are alternatives to washing and massaging and loving your automobile, fellas. Here's a consumer product survey report. As we talk to people across the nation over and over again, we hear questions like these. What does it all mean? Where am I going? Why don't things seem to seem more worthwhile when we all work so hard and have so darn many things to play with? The question is, can your product fill this gap? <laughs> <laughs> now, remember that because they're after you. And as soon as you figure it out, See, they're going to sell it back to you if they can. You all started talking about how important love was, and you're right. And then they come out with love cosmetics. 
The other day, I was booked into, if, if you'll forgive me, a Holiday Inn motel. I didn't know it until I got there and there wasn't any other place to stay, so I stayed there. <laughs> the morning, I went down for breakfast. And, well, the first thing I noticed was the rounding off the table fell off as soon as I sat down. And that just amused me no end. And so I started reading this little pamphlet about Holiday Inns, which is 200 pages thick. <laughs> and on the front cover, it has these pictures of the, well, this fellow, he's screwing in this little tiny yellow light bulb, you see, in the sign. And it says, Holiday Inn inspectors check every detail. <laughs> And then it explains that there are 26 inspectors for 200 pages of a directory. <laughs> That's eight pages per inspector, see? So at this point, my appetite was really whetted, and I started leafing through this directory. And the more I went through, the more I came to realize, you know what's going to happen is that folks are going to realize that motels are like automobiles. They make you feel bad. And they're going to stop going to motels. And I'll bet you these folks have already figured that out, and they're going to find a way to sell it back to us, see? I can just see the board of directors at the meeting. Hey, Joe, there's a big upswing in the camping movement, that right? A lot of folks not staying in motels anymore. They're going out to live in the woods, that right? What can we do about it? We'll buy the woods. <laughs> Joni Mitchell's song, you know, they took all the trees and put them in a tree museum and charged all the people a dollar and a half just to see them. Well, that's what Holiday Inn has done. You can now, I got to the back of the book, and there is this full page ad about Holiday Inn camping places, see? It's a franchise deal. And you can run one as a franchiser if you want to, or you can stay in one. And they advertise that with them come all the comforts of home. I mean, just what you want when you go out in the woods, right? <laughs> They've got a swimming pool. They've got a ceramic tiled hot showers and they've got a gift shop. <laughs> so you keep your eye on them, I'm telling you, see. As soon as you figure it out, they're gonna sell it back to you. You, you find out about bicycling and some bicycle shop owner don't wanna sell, sell you a 10-speed one instead of a three-speed one, see. So you gotta, you gotta watch that all the time. What else we got here? I'm coming to the end, I truly am. There's this great passage on of Easy Rider where George is talking about freedom. And he says, what's wrong with freedom? That's what it's about, isn't it? And he says, oh yeah, that's right. That's what it's all about, all right. But talking about it and being it, that's two different things. I mean, it's hard to be free when you're bought, when you are bought and sold in the marketplace. Of course, don't ever tell anybody that they're not free because then they're going to get real busy killing and maiming to prove to you that they are. Oh yeah, they're gonna to talk to you and talk to you and talk to you about individual freedom, but they see a free individual, it's gonna scare them. Well, it does scare them. You're taking a bit of a risk. But we've heard this lesson from religions over the years, from philosophers, William James, lives based on having are less free than lives based either on doing or on being. The Bhagavad Gita, the man who abandons all pride of possession reaches the goal of peace supreme. And I think it's in, uh, in Matthew 19, that story about the, the rich fellow that comes up to Jesus and says, uh, you know, how, how can I, how do I get to heaven? How do I do it? And Jesus says, well, you got to first, you got to take care of all the commandments, see? And he says, well, I've done that. And he says, what else I got to do? And Jesus says, well, look, you've got to get off this possession thing. Because you've got all these things you own, see? And you've got to get rid of all those, and you've got to give your money to poor people, and give up going after possessions all the time, and just follow me, and go my way. And a rich fellow thinks about that a while, and it's very hard for him, see? Because he's got all these possessions, that's what it says. And it never, never does really say what he did. But at that point, Jesus turns and he says that... Uh, uh, mighty going to be mighty hard for a rich fellow to get into heaven. So I suspected he probably didn't make it. But that's in, that's in all the religions. I mean, they've been telling us that over and over again. 
And the philosophers are saying the same thing. The psychiatrists are saying the same thing. Everybody's saying the same thing, except the television, the commercial television. Now, just to leave you with one little bit of an answer, because I hate to leave you with nothing at all, I think there is continued hope for trying to move the networks a little bit, and they are so powerful that you have to try to move them a little bit. So the efforts of citizens groups to organize, to do the kind of things I, I talk about in a little Bantam paperback called How to Talk Back to Your Television Set, on which I should note I get no royalties, lest anyone think that's a commercial. Um, those are worthwhile, and we need to continue to do them. But I think we also need some restructuring of this institution, because there's just limits to what you can do with something that's owned lock, stock, and barrel by the, the guys who are shills for snake oil. And cable television, I think, offers us some hope, because it has the technological potential to offer an unlimited number of channels. And if you will insist upon it with your local city councils and franchising authorities, you can require the cable television system in your community to have to install the maximum number of channels that technology now makes possible, which is 27. That's what they're selling off the shelf. I mean, that's basically the minimum. There's 60 channel systems being installed. But no, nothing less than a, than a 20 or 27 channel system with the understanding in the franchise that as soon as there is a demand for more, more channels must be installed. And therefore, it's the cable guy's advantage to put in more at the outset. Anybody can get on the system who wants to get on it. The cable operator is not responsible for content. Laws of libel, obscenity, and whatnot will apply to the guy that supplied the program. There is no economic reason for the cable industry not to support this, because it enables them to suck money out of both ends of the wire instead of one. You know, as a fellow said, why should we have cable television put in, honey? You know, out here where we live, we pay to have the garbage hauled out, not to have it hauled in. <laughs> but if you're going to have cable, the guy that's got it in his home pays, and the guy who's distributing the program pays. So the cable guy's getting richer, so he's got no reason to oppose it. Now, the other thing to insist on is half-inch videotape. Uh, half-inch videotape equipment costs roughly 1% of the price of two-inch videotape. And I won't go into the technical details, except that half-inch videotape equipment is cheap. It's universally available. Any one of you here this evening or, or in the audience would be capable of learning how to operate such a machine in you know, 15 minutes or an hour. Uh, and you can make your own television programs. At that point, uh, what Congress provided was to be the public property, to be operating the public interest, can be operated by each of us uh, as individuals. Um, so I think there is some hope. And let me close just with these two passages. One from E.B. White, a marvelous uh, passage that was used at the beginning of the Carnegie Commission report on public television. I think television should be the visual counterpart of the literary essay, should arouse our dreams, satisfy our hunger for beauty, take us on journeys, enable us to participate in events, present great drama and music, Explore the sea and the sky and the woods and the hills. It should be our Lyceum, our Chautauqua, our Minsky's, our, and our Camelot. It should restate and clarify the social dilemma and the political pickle. Once in a while it does, and you get a quick glimpse of its potential. See, television should be trying to turn you on to you, turn you on to life, and yes, occasionally to turn off television. Wouldn't it be marvelous if some evening the television would come on and the announcer would come out there in the middle of the news and he'd say, folks, there's a wonderful sunset tonight. It's so much more beautiful than anything that we could possibly show you that we're just going to shut down for the next hour and urge you all to go out and watch it. And you come back tonight after the sun's set and we'll show you some more programs. Okay? Now then you know we've made it. So I conclude with, uh, with Archibald McLeish, who's a great fella. And this is his message to you and my message to you. Tell me, my patient friends, awaiters of messages, from what other shore, from what stranger, whence was the word to come? Who was to lessen you? Open your eyes. There is only earth and the man. 
There is only you. Thank you. Commissioner McEwen has kindly consented to entertain questions from the audience. Uh, my only request uh, is that if you have a question, who? I, what did I say? I'm sorry. That's all right. Commissioner Johnson. Right. What did I say? That's right. That's all right. No. You had another phone. What? That's all right. You're just... <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he's a good commissioner, whoever he is. I, yeah. But he me. might be insulted. Yeah. That's all. Right. Excuse me. If if you have a question. <laughs> And we'll raise your hand so that the audio system can get to you. Uh, Commissioner Johnson will be happy to entertain your question. We have one of these marvelous electronic uh, eavesdropping uh, pieces of technology here. A long microphone that can point in your direction. Pick up your question. Let's check to make sure our gear is working. See, we were supposed to give you a delay or something. Are you, are you picking him up properly? All right, watch what you say. <laughs> I mean, this outfit was in enough trouble with the Iowa legislature before you and I started, right? <laughs> okay, what's your question? Now, do you know anything about this system of computerized um, thingies that the... <laughs> <laughs> thingies? <laughs> That's not okay. Uh, th um, computerized files on individuals that the government is using. Do you know anything about this? Well, I'm, I, may, uh, I may be found within them. <laughs> But uh, I don't operate them or know much about them. Those are mostly run by the Pentagon, I understand. They're out of our jurisdiction. <laughs> yes, back here in the uh, red shirt. In your opinion, what's the likelihood of viewer-sponsored television along the lines of Pacifica Radio, which is listener-sponsored? Well, let me explain about uh, see. Pacifica Radio is always in trouble with the commercial broadcasters, and I'll tell you why. Pacifica is a foundation-supported, listener-supported uh, radio uh, network with stations in New York, uh, uh, Berkeley, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Houston. I think they're in operation in Houston. They've been bombed twice. <coughs> they are in operation. Um, the reason why is that Pacifica is really the only radio system that operates within the free private enterprise system. They are the only station that goes to the audience and says, hey, if you like our programming, send us some money. Because if you don't, we're going to go off the air. Now, most of the fellows running the commercial stations know <laughs> if they went to their audience <laughs> and said, you know, send us $20 or we're going to stop broadcasting, they'd be off. <laughs> because they're not in the business of supplying programming to listeners and viewers. They're in the business of supplying listeners and viewers to advertisers, which has nothing to do with your choice. And subscription television, so-called, is another way of putting into the marketplace some viewer choice with regard to programming particularly if you mix this in with cable television. In other words, if you can produce a show and get a profit out of it that's adequate for one million dollars, let's say, and you can get two million people to pay 50 cents a piece to watch that program, you've got a commercially viable venture with an audience of two million. But any show on network television that had an audience of two million is out of business. But as you know, magazines can, can exist with all kinds of different levels of subscription and, 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 and a magazine stand uh, buying. Uh, so that cable plus a viewer supported, either in the Pacifica sense or in the sense of subscription television, 
does offer us the opportunity to make television into a medium more like the magazine industry, where if there's support for it uh, in the marketplace, uh, it can exist. That is not true today with commercial radio and television. You have no way of really affecting the programming that is made available to you. And when they say that people like what they get, well, the choice you never know is the choice you never make. They've, you know, they've never really been given the option to choose. Okay. Well, I'd like to know if all these attitudes you're expressing are for real, how you've lasted three years under Nixon. And second of all, is it true that the FCC issued a directive to radio operators that they may not play any songs over the air that have pos positive reference to drugs or drug using? Um, your first question was how I lasted on the FCC? I duck a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, at one time, uh, one of the state associations of broadcasters uh, passed a resolution which they sent to President Nixon calling for my impeachment. And uh, this uh, really brought the broadcasters to a peak of excitement and this uh, movement moved, uh, went like uh, wildfire across the country and five state associations of broadcasters joined in this uh, call. And uh, the administration was pretty interested in it too. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> trade press supported it editorially. And, and then they got to checking and they found there was no procedure for impeaching FCC commissioners. So. <laughs> now I've got a seven year uh, appointment. Uh, started in 1966 and it uh, runs to 1973, which some people think is longer than the president's term runs, but I guess that's still open uh, question. Um, the telephone company has taken a little different perspective. Uh, uh, I've uh, written for some time about the uh, failure of the telephone company to serve the public interest in terms of improved quality of service, lower rates, uh, rates of introduction of new technology, and so forth. And the company kept putting me down and not paying any attention and so forth. So I finally gave a speech called uh, Why I Am a Conservative or For Whom Does Bell Toil? <laughs> and in this speech, I pointed out that Bell Management was so ingenious that it had managed to come forward with policies that simultaneously make for higher rates for consumers and lower rates of return for shareholders. And I documented this with about 18 case studies. And uh, it did get their attention. <laughs> and they responded by filing a petition to disqualify me from ever speaking out again in the area of telephone rate regulation on the grounds that anyone who would uh, uh, come out in favor of higher rates of return for shareholders was obviously biased against the interests of management. But that, uh, uh, that attempt of theirs likewise did not succeed. But there, there are a great many people who just assume I wouldn't uh, uh, say quite as much as I do. Um, now, your, your last question was about uh, the recent uh, drug lyrics decision. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Yes, there, that is true. Um, <laughs> the FCC has repealed the First Amendment and not told anybody. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, under the new leadership, uh, we uh, do, from time to time, uh, do things that I think are not very wise and not very much in the public interest, but they very seldom do something that's kind of stupid, and I think they finally kind of slipped on this one. Uh, because it's the, uh, it's the one time when a dissenting opinion of mine has received the endorsement of Broadcasting Magazine and the National Association of Broadcasters, <laughs> as well as the American Civil Liberties Union and others who are filing to uh, reverse this decision in courts, uh, as it undoubtedly will be reversed. Uh, let me first explain that it has, a, you know, nothing really to do with drugs. I mean, I think you can tell from my speech tonight I'm not in favor of drugs. I'm in favor of the perpetual high on life. Um, I, you know, I don't think the, the answer is to be found in, uh, in alcohol or quiet world uh, or in, in any uh, other alternative chemical. Um, but what the FCC did in this ruling I mean, you know, put aside for a moment the fact that it happens to deal with, in the words of the FCC, song lyrics tending to glorify the use of marijuana and other drugs. Put that aside for a moment. What is constitutionally infirm about what they're doing is that they provide no standard whatsoever for the broadcaster. 
And it is, in the language of the Supreme Court, void for vagueness. It is, it is such a vague standard in the, in the area of speech and artistic expression uh, that, it, that it cannot stand as an assault on the First Amendment. At least that would be my interpretation of past court precedent. Whether or not, in fact, the court decides that way will, will remain to be seen. Uh, but it's very difficult you know, to, to listen to a song lyric and say that you know, this particular lyric is trying to encourage people to use drugs or discourage people to use drugs or is simply saying that we're living in a society in which some people are using drugs. Uh, and for, for example, we, we got a briefing on this from the Pentagon. And they came around on their drug lyrics briefing, which was put together for, you know, Nixon called the record companies and the broadcasters into the White House. And so, well, you know, one of those drug lyrics on the air, and they all said, yes, Mr. President. Uh, and for that occasion, uh, they put together this briefing on drug lyrics. Well, in the briefing, which they then brought over and showed the FCC, um, uh, they had lyrics like, uh, war is out, peace is the new thing. What's that got to do with drugs? You know? mm -hmm. And uh, 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 the song, uh, itemize the things you covet as you go through this life, uh, you know, what not, and term insurance for your wife and all this. I mean, a great, it's an attack on the commercial standards of conspicuous consumption. Nothing to do with drugs. So there's some question as to what's really going on here. You know, what is it that they're trying to suppress in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of content? But one of the songs they single out that did have to do with drugs is The Pusher. Now, those of you who've heard the song, I mean, here is a lyric like, uh, uh, you know, God damn the pusher man, and even a line, if I were president of this land, I'd declare total war on the pusher man. All right, now, they're not supposed to play that because that tends to glorify the use of drugs. <laughs> I mean, what is this? I, and there are a lot of people who do know something about it who say that they think that the anti-drug spots that are going on are in fact doing more to encourage drug usage than to discourage drug usage. Which may be why the cigarette companies that uh, as soon as they discovered the cigarette advertising was going off, immediately upped the nicotine content in the cigarettes. Are you aware of that? So as to hook more firmly people who would not be seeing the advertising on television? Maybe why some of them are now registering trademarks for marijuana cigarettes. You know, I mean, it's just like cable television. I mean, FCC wouldn't hear of it at first until it all came to be owned by the broadcasters, and then suddenly it was all right, and we were prepared to open it up a bit, see? So I think as the as control over the marijuana business shifts, perhaps we'll see a shift in administration policy on that. I don't know. It remains to be seen. But in any event, that's, uh, that's the way it is. <laughs> Uh, it's been estimated in recent surveys that uh, the American public gets over 50, well, around 50 percent of the news from uh, TV network uh, news that's broadca uh, broadcasted over the television uh, stations. Would you care to comment on this, and would you care to comment on what controls you would advocate? Well, you're, uh, I'm not sure I understand you. You're asking, uh, there, there, there have been polls that indicate most Americans say they get most of their information from television. Uh, one should note that is not just the newscast, it includes also the soap operas, which are one of the principal forms of educational television. Uh, I'm quite serious about that. I mean, there have been polls done on you know, where people get information about various subjects, and they often reply that they find out from the soap operas, like you know, whether their daughter should get an abortion and how they go about getting a divorce and things like that. That's where they learn that sort of thing. Um, but now, from there on, I'm not sure of what it is you're, uh, what it is you're asking me. For instance, uh, Vice President Agnew has been raging for control, more controls on the television networks in terms of accuracy, in terms of their journalistic reporting. Uh, do you favor any such controls? What sort of controls do you favor on the TV news networks? Do you think they've been guilty of uh, very flagrant violations or what? Well, okay. Let me say this about TV news. I, I think that... Most people who look at television objectively, and that's very difficult to do, it's very difficult to look at it at all, but uh, uh, <laughs> most people who look at it objectively would, would concede, I think, that, that the news is really television's you know, finest half hour. 
Uh, and that the principal problem with television is not the news, but the fact that very little of the news or public affairs or anything else that matters uh, is ever found in prime time when the people are watching. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't some things that I would do, you know, wouldn't do differently. Uh, I know many of these fellows in Washington who, who work for the networks and, and the anchor men and so forth. And, and uh, uh, in my judgment, I think they're you know, highly professional guys. They're intelligent and they're, they're responsible. They're interested in their profession and what they're doing. And they've, they've written themselves far more than Agnew has ever read about journalistic ethics and what their problems are. They're very candid about it openly. I mean, Walter Cronkite has said, you know, we've barely dipped our toe into investigative reporting. And, and uh, Dick Salant has said they need an hour of uh, news in the evening to really get the information out. Walter Cronkite has commented about the problems of uh, just the limited amount of information you can get out in a half hour. And uh, uh, what a tragedy it is that more people don't read newspapers because it means that television news has got to perform a very summary service of newspapers as well as trying to get in a little documentary on something. They really ought to try to be doing other things. Um, in general, the FCC has stayed out of uh, news and documentaries and has generally been unanimous in doing so. Uh, when the Democratic Party complained about network's coverage of the Democratic National Convention, uh, and there were a majority of Democrats on the commission at that time, and the uh, position of the Democratic Party was in no way whatsoever ambiguous from the statements that leaders were making and quoted in the press. The commission voted unanimously not to interfere in that, that what the networks had done was within the range of professional discretion that's given to them. Uh, when uh, Agnew criticized the commentary uh, after Nixon's uh, speech, uh, that first blast of, of Agnes from Des Moines. Uh, we responded to a complaint from a, a lady in Houston about the commentary, and again, it was unanimous that uh, that was fully within the prerogative of, of network news. Uh, I think the FCC's record on this is, is pretty good. Uh, I wish Agnews were as good. The, the problem uh, with intimidation always is that there's no way of uh, you know, putting the horse back in the barn. Uh, it's typical for, uh, for, for censors. The theory of this country is that we put all ideas out in the marketplace of ideas. And that means the ideas that we hate and despise and really don't like, they're ugly ideas. Because anybody can put out the ideas everybody agrees with. But you put out the ideas you don't agree with, and then you see it, and you can personally reject that idea. That's when your beliefs really grow and develop, and when, when your belief in America really means something. If somebody's kept all that stuff from you, you've never evaluated it yourself. And we believe in this country that truth emerges out of this chorus of voices of 200 million Americans talking about what they believe and how they see it, what they think the facts are, and what their opinions are. And out of that, a truth will emerge. And the mass media are one check on government one way to help us engage in that process. And when Agnew goes on television and says the American people cannot believe the facts in CBS documentaries, which he said in Boston, see, think about what's he saying? What he's saying is they should believe instead me, Spiro Agnew and Richard Nixon. Believe what your government tells you. Don't believe what your press tells you. Well, of course, the fact is you ought to be a little cynical of, of both. That's fine. But, but, you know, don't, we don't assume in this country that the government has the monopoly on truth. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Every president has always tried to influence the media. There's nothing new about what Nixon's doing. Roosevelt went over the heads of the newspapers directly to the American people by way of radio because he didn't like what the newspapers were saying. So there's nothing partisan in what I'm saying. And there, maybe there's nothing wrong with a president and a vice president trying it. What's wrong is when they get away with it. If the media don't stand up to them and fight back, if you don't stand up and talk back, that's, that's, that's what's wrong. Just keep the thing in balance. What's dangerous is when ABC Sports at the Buffalo Holy Cross game keeps the halftime ceremony off because they've got a rumor somebody's going to sing a song about peace. And as everybody knows, peace is controversial. And then a few weeks later, at the Army-Navy game, they parade out the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff 
and give him a nationwide television audience to give a little pitch on behalf of war, because that's not controversial. Now, when that kind of thing starts happening, then we're, you know, then we are in trouble, and the media is not doing its job. It's not standing up to government the way it should. Isn't life beautiful? Isn't life gay? Isn't life the perfect thing to pass the time away? 